Hello my friends, how are you today? I am so excited to be here to continue on our Under the Sea project. Now you might have noticed that Under the Sea is not on my design wall anymore. I am constantly juggling between different projects that are at different stages in order to stay up with what my students are doing in all of the different workshops and courses that I teach. So here on the wall today is Cave Clamshells. So it kind of follows our under the water theme, doesn't it? Cave Clamshells is a quilt that I made that has beautiful clamshell borders. We are in week four of Cave Clamshells right now. And today, this afternoon at four o'clock Eastern time, we have session four for our Cave Clamshells. So we've been working on cutting all of the applique shapes that are going to go on the middle border. Our um, final border is already completed and I might be able to drag one of those out to show you. I haven't quite completed all of the stitching on my clamshell borders, but this one is fully done. And so we're going to be adding the clamshell borders to this quilt. But the, the next step for me is to show how to add the applique to the inner border. So this inner border on my lap size quilt, it's a seven inch border. So I'm having to design a whole new applique pattern for that inner border because my original quilt had an 11 inch border and a 13 inch border. There were two different size borders in order to make this quilt work. So it's such a beautiful quilt. I'm so excited to get the applique borders done that I put away my Under the Sea project in order to focus on this one, which I am teaching this afternoon. But I do want to play around with some shells and some other ideas for our Under the Sea project. So we will get to cutting some shells using our rotary cut applique techniques today. Good morning, Bev Henyon from Soggy, Maine. So nice to see you here today. Let me know if you're out there. I love to see who's watching live. And then of course, if you're watching the replay, let me know. Like and share this broadcast if you have friends that would love to learn how to rotary cut their applique. Now, one of the things that I often do on our Sewing and Slippers episodes is talk about our motivation, talk about our mindset. A quilter's mindset can be a tricky thing. Um, sometimes we get bogged down with too many projects. So I wanted to leave my other project on the wall today. I'm not going to pretend that I work on one project from start to finish. I am bouncing all over the place from project to project to project. And you're here as a, uh, getting a little glimpse of my world as a professional quilter and how I get things accomplished. Now, it is in bits and starts. I don't often have a long time to quilt at any one time. So you see little bits and pieces of projects on these Tuesday sessions. You're not going to see a project from the beginning all the way through to its conclusion. That's just not the way I work. And I think other quilters struggle with this same mentality of um, having lots of choices, doing what you enjoy doing, not always finishing things because maybe the finishing process is not your favorite part of the project. So as we work through our Tuesday sessions, I might bring up a topic that has to do with mindset as well as techniques and ways of getting your quilts done. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a little bit about mindset, a little bit about multiple projects, and we're going to take time to move our project forward. And that is the name of the game. As long as your projects are moving forward, I don't mind having five projects going on at the same time. 
the frustration comes is when I can't move those projects forward and they just sit on the back burner and maybe they sit around for a year or two or 10 or 20. So we want to pick away at those old projects also if they still make us happy and we still want to complete those quilts. But we always want to keep making forward progress on all of our projects so that we don't forget about them. We don't leave them high and dry behind and they became become old, stale, and just a chore to work on. Uh, good morning, Linda. Wonderful to have you here today. Hey, Kathy. Nice to have you here. Um, you'll be late for the clamshell. No worries. Your dog had surgery this morning and you'll be picking her up at that time. Okay, Linda. So glad to hear that. Um, that he went in for surgery and hopefully everything's gonna be good. So thank you for letting me know, but no worries, come when you can. You can always watch the replay when we do our clamshell class, just like all the classes that I offer. Now, one of the other things that you're gonna notice in the background is that I've brought out our old glory quilt again. Janie has just finished the instructions for Old Glory in pattern form. So by the end of this week, we'll be posting Old Glory as a PDF pattern on the website. So you can make Old Glory and it's a wonderful opportunity to just dip your toe into rotary cut applique. That pattern uses the Grand Leaves Galore tool. That's the largest of the Leaves Galore tools and it is used to cut those beautiful wavy shapes on our stars as well as our stripes. So if you're wondering how you can get started using the Leaves Galore tools and just dip your toe in to see if it's something that you're gonna enjoy doing, Old Glory is a wonderful pattern for that purpose. So you'll be hearing um, about Old Glory and some emails that are gonna be coming out because I'm excited to announce when Old Glory gets up and on our website. So watch for that Friday or Saturday morning newsletter. I'm never sure how I'm gonna have time to write the newsletter on Friday or Saturday. If you're not getting my newsletter, go to suepellindesigns.com and where you see the pretty quilt on the right hand side, click on that register button and you will get, you will start getting the Applique Cafe newsletter so you can hear about all these big announcements, all of the fun things that are happening and all of my latest news. So that's why Old Glory is over there on the back wall. And I'm also very excited because that, that Old Glory pattern always reminds me of the 4th of July. Now I know the 4th of July is a long way away, but I have something very exciting happening for the 4th of July. I'm gonna be having um, a friend come from France who's gonna stay with us for a month. She's 15 years old and she is the daughter of an exchange student that I had years ago when she was in her first or second year at university. So lots of exciting things going on around the Old Glory pattern and around the 4th of July. So I will be sure to share more about that when Odile's daughter comes to visit me for a month. Lauren and I are gonna have a blast showing her around the United States. It is her first time here and it's gonna be great fun. Okay, we even might make that quilt with her. Oh, that would be such a great thing. I will probably make that quilt with her so she can bring it home as a souvenir of her trip. Ah, oh, what a great idea. I love sewing with kids. 15 years old is a perfect place to start. Oh my goodness, the ideas just keep flowing. When you see a project, project like that, there's so many opportunities to make that simple quilt. Well, good morning, Elaine from Mississauga. Wonderful to see you here today. Okay, so let's get on with our little uh, talk about your quilter's mindset. Last week, we talked about um, uh, design, the design process, right? And so this week, I want to talk a little bit about your quilts as your art. Why are we making our quilts? 
Well, there are a hundred reasons why you are making your quilts, and I'm going to give you my reasons right now. I think that this world deserves to have more beautiful objects in it. When we surround ourselves with beautiful objects, it just makes my heart happy. And I love teaching the art of producing your own beautiful objects that you can surround yourself with, particularly in your home, but also to use as gifts to brighten somebody else's world, to create something beautiful for yourself or for others. So that is my main purpose of doing what I do. I love to bring more beauty and more objects of beauty into this world. Now I'm a textile girl going way back and I worked in the textile industry and I've been in the quilting industry since my mom and I had a quilt shop back in the early 80s. So this is a long history for me and my quilting also brings me back to my roots. It brings me back to the tradition that is long held in my family that busy hands are um, Keeping your hands and your mind busy is a very important aspect of my day. I don't like to sit and do nothing with my hands. I can't sit and watch television without having something to work on. Whether it's knitting or crocheting or quilting or something else, sometimes it's sitting and writing emails while I'm uh, watching television, but my hands are always busy. So if you're the type of person that likes to always keep your hands busy, maybe that's your motivation for quilting. Idle hands are the devil's playground. I don't know how many times I heard that as a child, and that has really stuck. I really feel as though um, keeping your hands and your mind busy is a very positive thing in my life, and I hope it is in yours. So I would love to see in the comments, whether you're here live or you're watching the replay, what is your primary motivation for making your quilts? Is it to give them away as gifts? Is it because you just enjoy the process? Is it relaxing for you? Does it bring you great joy just to be working with your hands? Is it the end product that you love, creating of something of beauty for the world to enjoy? All of these are wonderful reasons to quilt. And I'd love to know what your motivation is for making your quilts. Why do you have this hobby? So that is going to go a long way knowing why you do this to giving yourself permission to spend that 20 minutes, a half an hour, eight hours a day if you wish to pursuing this hobby. We don't need permission necessarily, but sometimes it's good to give ourselves permission to do something for ourselves, for our own, um, for our own joy, for our own knowledge, for building our skills, it's good to give yourself permission to spend that amount of time each day, and frankly, sometimes to spend the money on yourself to do something that you absolutely love. Now, we don't have to justify to somebody else our hobby, but at times it's nice to have that vision in your mind of why we do what we do. So you give yourself permission to spend that time, to spend that little chunk of change in your mad money account so that you can do the things that make you happy. Okay, motivation here. Um, good morning to our Facebook friends. I'm here live and my motivation is to remind Sue to chat about the I Found a Quilted Heart Community Service Project. Okay, thank you for that, Penny. I definitely will. Um, my motivation is all the reasons that I just listed, Margaret. Well, thank you. An item of beauty and a learning experience. Okay, fantastic. Anita's watching from New York. Um, 
you finished, Margaret, you finished all of your projects except your My Magical Garden quilt, and you're working on block number four. Margaret, congratulations. It's wonderful to have that sense of accomplishment, but not over, everybody works that way. Somebody like me, I like to have lots of projects going on at the same time. That way, I can pick up a project that feels good at the time. It's something I feel like doing. There are times that I feel like binding because I want to sit in front of the television and do some mindless handwork. So binding is a, is a thing that I really enjoy hand sewing my bindings. Um, there are other times that I just want to cut and fuse because that is my absolute favorite part of the process. There are other times that I just want to dive into that fabric. So washing the fabric ironing the fabric and fusing the fabric really gives me that um, that tactile experience where I'm feeling the fabric, I'm working with it, I'm planning it as I'm smoothing it, as I'm ironing it, I'm planning what's going to happen with that fabric. So it's planning time, but it's also mindless work that I can be doing while I'm brainstorming and while I'm planning. So there's all different phases of the project that I enjoy for different reasons. And depending on my mood, I might want to be on a different phase of that project. So I'll pull out a project that that's at, that's at the phase that I'm currently uh, desiring, the, the, the phase that I'm currently excited about working on. Okay, so I can't wait to see what your motivation is. Keep on commenting on your motivation for making your quilts, and I will remember to talk about the community service project that just happened this past weekend at our quilt show. Um, so yes, in the coming months, you have multiple projects in the works because Christmas is coming sooner than we think. So yes, there will definitely be opportunities to be making gifts for other people. Hey, I just want to show you one of the projects that I've been working on in my many, many, many different projects. Um, this is a prototype for our December class in our Ahead of the Curve membership. It is a quilted basket. Inside is space for your Christmas cards or whatever else you would like to put in there. And I made these clips years ago just for my, uh, my note board. That all has strings across it. I tack up little notes and postcards to the note board. But these are going to become a part of our project. I'll probably do a cluster of two or three little holly leaves during the class. And we will decorate our Four Seasons wall basket with these different little embellishments in order to make it more appropriate for different seasons. So maybe you have a summer birthday, you want to put your birthday cards in here as they come into you in the mail, and so we're going to decorate that with a little summer decoration as well. We're going to have four seasons of decorations that we can just clip on and add to the front of our wall basket in order to decorate for the season. So this is going to be a really fun project, and again, it's in progress. I haven't finished sewing yet. This is the prototype and I'm working on the method for making this project and my head of the curve members get to see it first. They're the ones that are going to do this in December. I think this is our dis early December workshop. So be thinking about that as a gift for somebody special on your list. You'll notice I use some neutral fabric on there so it can go for any season. Hey, wouldn't it be fun to put a little miniature American flag on the front of that wall basket in order to decorate for the patriotic holidays? And this morning I looked up all the patriotic holidays where we could be flying the flag, and there are loads of them. So you'd have lots of opportunity to use either your flag that you make from the new Old Glory pattern or decorating your wall basket with a little miniature flag on the front. So much fun. 
You're looking forward to doing the basket. So am I. You're going to try to take a few days off so you can attend the workshops live. Absolutely. Penny, can you sign me up for the basket project now, please? <laughs> Thanks, Bev. I can see that there's some enthusiasm for these new projects that are coming up, and that's just wonderful. But let's get back to our old project. So I want to share you share with you a little bit about what we talked about last week on Sewing in Slippers with Sue. If you missed last week's episode, you can go to YouTube and you can type in um, episode number 182 for Sewing in Slippers with Sue, where we worked on making our jellyfish for the Under the Sea project. We worked with Angelina Fibers and with the Hearts and More tools to make that jellyfish come to life. This week, we're gonna talk about maybe making some shells Rocks are easy. We can put some rocks in our underwater seascape, but I think we need to focus on making some shells. So last week we talked about design, inspiration, the scale of the items that you're putting in your under the sea project, and the style. Are they gonna be realistic? Are they gonna be cutesy and kiddish? Um, so you can find inspiration depending on the style that you are going for. So let me share my screen with you and I'm gonna show you a little bit of my motivation or I should say a little bit of my inspiration that came from the internet this morning. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and show you some of the doodles that I found online when I typed in under the sea creatures. So this is several layers in. I typed in under the sea creatures and came up with all kinds of different things. And I've just been looking at these different ideas and seeing how they would translate into my project. So I just glance at all of these different ocean ideas or under the sea doodles. And when I come across something that looks of interest to me, I love this sea turtle right here. Isn't he beautiful? But there's also all types of shells, but these are a little bit stylized. They're not really realistic. And so I probably wouldn't use this particular version of the shells. But as I go through all of these different ideas, I can probably find something that's a little bit more my style. This is a little bit cutesy, but it's also a little bit, it's kind of half cutesy and half realistic, isn't it? So let's look at some of the elements on this file in order to get inspiration for our quilt. Now I'm certainly not gonna copy any of these per se, but I love all of the different ideas. And when I look at some of these very simple shapes, look at this fish right here. Can't you picture this as a full leaf shape that we have cut with our curves into these beautiful stripes on this particular fish. Now look at his tail section. It's just almost like a little heart shape, but it's got a couple of extra little curves in there. That would be really, really fun to create. But today I wanted to focus on the shells. I just love this shell right here. This shell, oh, I think I just made it smaller, but that's okay. I'm going to go back to what you're seeing. Hold on one second. I lost, I lost my screen. You're seeing the screen before. There we go. Now I'm seeing the same thing. Okay, so look at this shell right here. Do you see these S-shaped curves? These are all S-shaped curves right there. Isn't that fun? I just love that I can imagine how to make something like this 
based on those five basic shapes that I can cut with the Leaves Galore tools. Then we have our scallop shell. Well, a scallop shell, a lot of that work can be done in the quilting, right? So all we need is a basic shape for the scallop shell. Well, we certainly could simplify it, and these little petals right here can be petal shapes that are cut with the Hearts and More tool. So we could certainly do that, or we can cut one big rounded shape and then just flute those edges. So I think we need to play with several of these different ideas today. I don't know how much time we have and if we'll run out of time, but I wanted to show you where my inspiration was coming from. Now, I do love some of these more realistic um, designs. Now, look at the sea kelp, for example. That sea kelp has some really beautiful wavy shapes that could absolutely be made from S-shaped curves, but then maybe we take our scissors to them and make them a little bit more interesting, or we could use a decorative stitching along the edges to create a little bit more of an intricate shape. Now there's one design that I haven't found yet that I would love to find, but what I wanted to show you was one of these full landscapes. So when you look at one of these full landscapes, we do have some of our design elements. There's a fish right there that we could use. Uh, we, we made a fish that was similar to that, so we could use our fish. There's these beautiful coral pieces here in the background, which are pretty straightforward. They're just, that would be made just with one fabric and then maybe fluting the edges a little bit. Here's our jellyfish, but look at all of the different vegetation under here. A lot of that vegetation can be done with thread play just using your quilting stitches and some very decorative threads to do some of these little tiny thin little um uh, uh i i i'm not sure what to call it um seaweed okay but some type of veg vegetation that's under the sea if i use my beautiful variegated threads from the 2D thread line, I can make some gorgeous under the sea weeds and um, fill up a whole lot of space, but just do it in the quilting phase. So we don't have to have as many critters as you might think to make that under the sea um, scene. Now, one of the features of this under the water scene that I love are these like sea cucumbers over here. They are these long tubes that have a circular top on them that's shaded. So it looks like you can look right inside those tubes. That would be something really fun to do. And it looks to me super duper easy. This one also has those types of sea cucumber cubes and it has this pretty little shell down below. So I think we need to use these more realistic uh, pictures as inspiration for some of our shapes. So I uh, looked at some of these photos and then I just started playing on paper. So I'm going to stop that share. And I'm gonna show you what I played with on paper. Now, I'm no artist. I don't know how to draw at all, but I can make some basic shapes and I'm much better at cutting things out of fabric and getting the look that I want in fabric rather than drawing. But I have to break down those shapes into what I can cut with the tools. So here's my first attempt at a basic conch shell, okay? And I've just written in some notes, like if I had some stripey fabric with a tan color to it, that would be great for the outside of the conch shell. And then this little petal shape over here, this kind of half of a heart, if it had a pink interior, 
that would be really beautiful and make it a little bit more realistic. And then these topper shapes are really just rectangles with the corners cut off for the different sections on the top of that shell. So I know we can make something like this and having it laying down in the sand in our, um, in our landscape, in our seascape, so that we could have a beautiful shell under the water there. Then, of course, I love a good scallop shell. I am not an artist. I don't know how to draw a scallop shell, but you can go online and you can type in how to draw a scallop shell and you'll come out with some tutorials on how to do that. So you don't have to be an artist to do something very, very simple like this. So let's look at the different elements. A little triangle with the corner cut off, another little triangle with the corner cut off with one of our round tools. This is a triangle, but it's got all three corners cut off and rounded, and this is our standard petal shape. So if we do graduated petals that are different sizes and maybe we round those edges, we're going to come out with something that looks like a scallop shell. Now nobody's going to be comparing that to a shell that they actually have in their hand. So as long as you get the feel and the colors of the scallop shell, we're going to be golden. Now, if I made two scallop shells and opened them up, I could even put a pearl in the middle. So some of those beautiful Angelina fibers that we used last week, if we use the pearlescent colors and make a mass of those fibers and then fuse it, it's gonna come off as a shiny object. And we could cut a little pearl with our one inch hearts and more tool to go between two scallop shells. Wouldn't that be fun? Okay, so let's get started and let's find a little bit of fabric that we can play with. Now it doesn't have to be the final fabric that we're gonna use because we're still in design phase. We're still in the phase where we need to figure things out. So I'm gonna go down on my workstation. I'm gonna change my camera to my workstation so you can see the fabrics that I've pulled out and um, how that might translate into some shiny objects for the bottom of the sea. So uh, let's just grab, you know what, I'm just gonna put this aside for a minute so that you can see some of these shiny fabrics. I bought a fat quarter pack at one time, and in that fat quarter pack was all of these um, fabrics with a shiny material going in one direction. So this is woven with a metallic uh, weft, I think, and the warp, I think, is the cotton. So they would stretch the cotton fibers the whole length of the loom and then they would weave the silver fibers back and forth across that cotton. So as it comes undone, as you can see, I've washed my fabric. As it comes undone, you're seeing the individual fibers of both cotton and that metallic-y tinsel kind of color. So what that does is it gives you an iridescent fabric. So I have an entire collection of iridescent fabrics in everything from white to beige, all the neutrals, all the way gray, all the way through silver, and all the way to a beautiful black that has that gorgeous silver iridescence to it. So I pulled out these fabrics thinking that it might be fun to do something with these iridescent fabrics um, in our shells. So that's one thought right there. But I'm not gonna work with those iridescent fabrics today because I haven't made my plan. I haven't figured out the scale of those uh, shells. So I need to work with something in the meantime. So I don't know about you, but I have this entire basket or bucket filled with all different fabrics 
that normally are fused. I have an entire bucket here filled with leftover pieces of fused fabric. Well, hopefully you don't have quite the collection that I do. I've been collecting for years, so you may not have quite this uh, extensive of a collection, but I can find some beige fabrics, some peachy or pink fabrics, even some beautiful batik fabrics. Oh, this one's not fused. Uh, so that I can start playing with these different shapes and maybe come up with something that I'm going to love. So I'm just gonna pull out a few appropriate fabrics, but at this stage, even if they're not the appropriate fabrics, it will still be fun to play with whatever you've got. So I often just play with any old color, especially if I've used it for a project before. Look at that little mermaid under the sea. If I've used it for a project before and I know I'm not gonna use the rest of that fabric anytime soon, that would be a great piece of fabric to use for play just so that we can get an idea of what we're going, the shapes that we're going to make and how they're all going to go together. So if you don't have a collection of fabric like this, you can absolutely work with paper as well. But I'm pulling out a few fabrics to play with and you'll notice that they're all wrinkly and messy. So it's absolutely necessary for me to grab an applique pressing sheet. I'm gonna turn my iron on. So I'm gonna say that word again, that name of that lady that's gonna turn my iron on. So uh, all of your irons may go on. Alexa, turn on sewing. That's gonna get okay. my that's going to get my little iron right here on so I can start working with some of these fabrics. Right now they're too messy, they're too wrinkled. So I need my applique pressing sheet on my pressing surface. I need a nice hot iron and I can pull out some of these scraps of fabric that I had from other projects and I can start working with those but only after I give it just a little bit of a hot press. So I think I wanna work with the beige first. That might make that nice little um, uh, conch shell out of this beige fabric. And if I get it right the first time, I'll actually end up with something that I can use. If I don't get it right the first time, we'll just call it practice. And then you can learn from all of my mistakes. And then when we put a pattern together for this under the sea project, we will give you the actual measurements, not the measurements that I'm playing with right now. Now I just came across something interesting. I have fusible here on the front of my fabric. Something went wrong and somehow I got fusible on the front of my fabric. So I was very careful as I was pressing this to avoid that area. Now, one of the comments that always comes up is, or one of the questions, can you remove fusible from the front of your fabric? And generally, the answer is no. So I'm just gonna cut out that little section so I don't end up hitting it with my iron, and I've still got loads of fabric to work with that is fused that's not gonna gunk up my iron. Then I'm gonna go for a little bit of this peachy pink color. Do you remember that the inside of that conch shell, we wanted a little blush of pink? This is more peachy color, but I do have a pink here as well. So I'll be able to play with both of those colors and see which one is going to poke out from the inside of that conch shell and look the most realistic. Now I also pulled from that pile of fabric this beautiful batik fabric that has all these little swirls on it. Now I'm not ready to use this fabric yet, but I did notice it and to me it looks like, even though it looks like little roses, it really might work 
for some under the water uh, creatures or coral. So I'm gonna pull this out now that I've found it again. And instead of being in the rag bag or the scrap basket, I'm gonna go here and put it in my under the sea collection of fabrics. In my under the sea collection, I have all of the design elements we've worked with in the past few weeks. I have my background fabric that I've sewn and gotten ready for that background. And I'm putting little inspiration pieces in there as well. This is a piece of fabric that has a little stylized lobster on it. So even though I have a lobster that's more realistic, in the future, if I wanna do a cartoony lobster, this one is staying in my critters basket. So this is critters. Right now I'm working on underwater critters. So all my little inspiration drawings are gonna go in there as well, so I can refer to them later. Now, when I talked about what we did last week, we worked on our iridescent um, jellyfish. So we have these two pieces to choose from when we go to put together our, uh, our seascape. I really love this one that has the fabric under it because of all of that shading with the, um, the lines on it. But I think this one is probably gonna be my winner because I can make all of those lines and all of that shading and all of that detail with my quilting. But wouldn't it be nice to take a piece of this that I made last week and cut out a little pearl from that iridescent fabric. So I'm gonna keep that in mind that I might wanna use the leftovers from this project as a little pearl for my scallop shell. So we're gonna try making the conch shell first, I think, and then the scallop shell. So let's have a little fun with that. So I have my hearts and more tools handy. I believe it's the hearts and more tools that I'm going to use to create my shell shapes. Now I also pulled out this little bit of fabric because some of my shell shapes, maybe they need to be a gray color instead of a beige. So I pulled out this little scrap of fabric. Let me just get that ironed and ready to go as well. If I iron it now, within the next 10 or 15 minutes, it's going to be cooled and ready to cut. Right now, because I've ironed it again, it's tacky and it's sticky, and I really am gonna have a hard time working with that um, for the next five, 10, or 15 minutes. So let's put aside our iron, and let's start to look at that conch shell. So I've got this pretty beigey fabric, and let me look at my drawing for the conch shell. Where did I put it? Oh, those are the other shell. Oh, here's my conch shell. So the shape that I want to make is this main part of the body of the shell. Now, in one way, I can look at this as part of a leaf shape. So I could do a big fat leaf shape, and a four inch leaf shape might be just the one to do but I could also make that big fat leaf shape with my rings and things tools or my hearts and more tools. So I'm looking at this rings and things tool and I think it might be just perfect for this shell. So I'm gonna take the rings and things, let me grab my rotary cutter, and I'm gonna cut out one petal shape with rings and things. When you're doing the prototypes, <coughs> we're not cutting hundreds of an item. I'm not cutting hundreds of leaves for my uh, cave clamshell quilt. I'm cutting one little piece that I may use for a shell. So that's a nice little shape for this part right here. And I wanna cut this top part almost straight across but maybe it has just a little bit of a dip to it. So I could certainly use the inside curve of my hearts and more tool to do that. I could also use the outside curve of my hearts and more to do that. 
So you see, I can use the outside curve to create this little line right here, or I can use the inside curve this way. I think that the inside curve is gonna be a little bit more graceful. So I'm actually gonna put my leaf right across a straight line here, because I wanna make that dip straight across. So I'm gonna go on this solid line, and I'm gonna go from inside curve to inside curve, just like this. So on this solid line, we're just gonna cut that inside curve. Okay, so that's the beginning of that shell. I don't wanna waste this fabric. We can certainly use this fabric for all of the other shell parts. So let's go ahead and uh, carve this up again into three little separate sections. So I'm going to do about a third, a third, and a third. I'm gonna use my inside curve once again. And let's see if I do a third there. I'm gonna divide this side up into three. And I'm gonna do a little inside curve here. And then one more inside curve right here. Okay, so now I've got the three little top sections. Well, quite honestly, I think it may be easiest just to curve these sections with our scissors at this point. We could certainly use a small parts and more tool and we could curve all of these points everywhere that we want a little curve. We could do that with our rotary cutter, but I think it's just as easy to use our scissors and just round off these tiny little bits. I don't want a big rounded corner. I want just a little tiny bit of a curve right here. Now this intersection is too wide. So I'm gonna trim it down and then I'm going to make some curved corners with my scissors. So everything that I do does not have to be rotary cut applique. I can certainly play with scissors as well, depending on where I am in the project. Okay, if I'm just rounding corners, sometimes it's easier to just use your scissors. Now this one's gonna be quite a bit smaller, so I'm gonna take off a good half an inch from that one. I wanna get almost the same angle as the original and then I'm just gonna round those corners. Just taking a little tip off here and there to round the corners of this uh, kind of a parallelogram shape. Okay, nothing fancy, super simple. I've got one more to do and it's just that little top part. Really what I need for that little top part is just a little nub. So I'm just gonna kind of cut that around with my scissors. Okay, so there you have it. There is the beginning of our little shell. Now the whole secret to this shell is this little heart shape piece over here with the pink center. So I'm not gonna use the pink right away. I'm gonna cut that little heart shape right here using uh, my tools, okay? I'm gonna cut a little heart shape right here that I have to just size it just right. So I think what I'm going to do is use a tiny little tool to make my heart shape. Maybe something like that. Maybe it needs to be a little bit bigger. Okay. And I'm just gonna cut a little partial circle, maybe a half circle. Let's start with a half circle. Now, normally when I do a half circle, I should be working on my rotating mat. So if I have a half circle, that's two and a half inches, and I'm gonna tuck that under here to be that extended part of my shell. Now, I wanna use that pink or peach to line that shell. So if I use two and a half inches here, 
I can't use two and a half inches for that piece, or maybe I can. Let's go ahead and do less than a half circle. Let me just cut this edge off straight. Let's do less than a half circle with that same tool. So instead of uh, going over to the 90 degree line, I'm gonna come over here to say the 70 degree line and just cut something less than that half circle. And if I tuck that right up under, I'm starting to get the look of the shell that I want. Now maybe that peach is not drastic enough of a difference in color. Maybe I want something even rosier. So let me try using this pink. I'm still gonna use the half circle. I'm gonna start at 60 right now. And maybe I'm gonna do a third layer so it really has some depth to it. That looks really, really pretty. So I can take all of these pieces I can layer them on my applique pressing sheet and I'm going to fuse all of those together in order to make my shell. So I'm just going to do a little rearranging here. I'm going to fuse these two pieces together. Then we're going to start working from the top backwards. So I'm going to place this piece here. Now there is a little bit of shadowing happening because I've got a very light color here in the foreground. So my pink underneath is showing through. So we may want to line this shell with another piece of this beige fabric. So we would have to cut another piece the same way and line this piece. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm simply going to build up my layers and then we can decide if we need to, um, I got a little speck of fusible on that shell right there. And I'm just gonna rub it off with my fingers before I press it again. We'll need to decide if we're going to line this shell in order to prevent that little bit of show through. So let's play with it first. Then we're going to need to put that on our background and see if it bothers us having this little bit of show through. I have a feeling that there's going to be enough going on that it's going to distract your eye from that. However, if it bothers you that you're seeing, um, especially if this is going to not go on the sand, but if this is going to go in the water, in the darker part of the background, then you may want to line this seashell if this is going to go on a dark color. If this is going to go on the sand, if it's going to go on like a, a beigey sandy color, then you could absolutely just put it on there and it's going to be fine, but it is going to get a little bit lost. So I think this is more likely going to go in front of some kelp, it's going to go on something green or blue, and so I may need to line the whole thing. So we could certainly cut a piece of fabric roughly the same size as what we've already got. And I would certainly use my tool for this. I'm not just going to freeform cut it, but what I can do is just cut a basic uh, leaf shape and put that behind the whole thing as a lining. So I've only got that little tip sticking out back here. Let's just cut off that tip. Now I've got that whole piece lined with another piece of fabric. It's not exact. It's definitely a different size. So you're going to have a little bit of shadowing over here. But remember, we're going to be doing a lot of decorative machine stitching around our design elements. So I think that's a beautiful little shell. I think that that one's ready to go and we can focus on a little scallop shell next. So for our scallop shell, I really need a pretty little print 
Um, maybe a little stripe for that scallop shell, but I don't have one handy just yet. So I'm just going to do a little prototype. You know what actually would be very pretty for the scallop shell is the background fabric that I'm using for my um, for my Baltimore quilt. If I had some fabric like this with a little bit of, of pink in it, that might be beautiful for my scallop shell. So I might want to find that fabric when I actually make the real scallop shell for the project. For now, let's just play. I'm going to play with some of this yellow fabric just so that we can get the shapes right. And what we're going to start with is a little triangle. So in order to make a triangle, super simple, I'm just going to start cutting my fabric with my uh, rotary cutter until I get the type of triangle that I'm looking for. Okay. So that's a great little triangle for the center of that scallop shell. Once again, we're going to round the corners. So you could certainly do that with your Hearts and More tool, but this is one scallop shell. So I'm not trying to make anything in bulk. I'm not trying to mass produce anything. So I'm simply going to cut it with scissors. When I do mass production, when I make bulk shapes like leaves and hearts and flowers for quilts with those shapes are repeated over and over again I don't pull out my scissors I simply make it with my rotary cutter but in this case I am cutting with scissors because I'm making one of something now I want to make the two little um, bits that stick out behind the bottom of that scallop shell so let's just make a bigger triangle see if that's going to work and just round those corners because I made a bigger triangle instead of making two separate little triangles here I'm going to layer these three layers together and it's going to automatically line that first fabric right okay because this is going behind it it's automatically uh, lining that so that I don't have a um, show through when I put one color over the other. So let me just trim that down so I can put this one on top. So that's looking pretty good. Now let's make some little scallop pieces. So let's get rid of all those little trimmings and let's start making our scallop pieces. I like this so far so I'm going to bring it over here on my pressing sheet and go ahead and press that together. Now I want to start making those little um, uh, petal shapes. So I'm going to fold my fabric and start my little petal shapes. And they need to be quite small. I'm not sure they need to be this small, but let's start there. I'm going to fold my fabric. I'm going to place my Hearts and More tool with the arrow on the fold. See that little arrow that goes right down the center of my tool and that is in the one inch circle. I'm using the arrow on the one inch circle but I'm going to make this as long as I can. So I'm going to go all the way down to the C here at the bottom of the tool. Now I'm not sure this is going to be big enough or wide enough but let's give it a try. Okay so after I open it up Yes, I think it's big enough. I think it's wide enough. I think it's going to work out beautifully, but I don't need all that length because it's going to be tucked up under here on my shell. Now we need to make several other pieces with a similar shape in order to fan out that shell. So I can make that same shape over and over again just by turning my tool over, arrow on the fold, letter E here. I've got a good 3 8 of an inch right there, so I can actually fold my fabric a little narrower so I don't waste any fabric. So I'm going to go here, arrow on the fold, all the way down to the letter E. I wish I had my rotating mat handy. I always forget to pull that out before these sessions, and then I don't want to be searching for it 
while I should be cutting with you. So yeah, I got a little bit messy there on my cut. Maybe I need to change my blade or I just need to use my rotating mat. So I'm gonna cut this down in length. I don't need the tip because these are gonna go one under the other and they're all gonna end up under this part of the shell. So boy, I think that's looking good so far. I'm gonna grab my rotating mat to make this whole process a little bit easier and I'm gonna cut several more of those shapes. I think I'm gonna need at least five total. And look what's happened when I've cut one shape next to the other. Isn't that nice? Nice use of your fabric. So we're gonna fold again. We're going to use the arrow and the letter E. So arrow to the letter E. Make sure your fabric is folded deep enough so that you can get all the way down to the letter E. And we're gonna cut again. So you're gonna repeat this process at least five times. If you don't get a clean cut, just clean up around the edge of your tool before you move the tool. There we've got a beautifully clean, sharp little petal. And there is the third petal for our scallop shell. Let's do two more, but I have a feeling I want the outside of that scallop shell to be curved. So let's look at that now before we go too far. I want to curve the outside of my scallop shell with a, sh with a curve that looks about like that. And then I'm going to cut my little petal and I'm going to go from the arrow down to the letter E. This time I'm not folding my fabric because I've got the second curve already cut. So I am really playing with you. I'm really trying to figure this out in the best way possible. I don't like the curve up top there, so I'm gonna adjust it. I'm just trying to figure this out in the best way possible so I can end my scallop shape with that curve. And I think that looks pretty good. I know it's gonna to be too long. So let's just trim that off before I tuck it up under. Now the challenge would be getting two that are exactly like this one. I didn't really have much of a method to my madness here. I was really just playing, but I'm really happy with the result. So how do I get that result again? But in reverse. If I cut this way again with the fabric fusible side up, I'm not gonna get the reverse of this design. So I actually need to turn my fabric over, fusible side on top, make that same little curve. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna turn that fabric over one on top of the other, and then I'm going to line up my tool with what I did the last time. I can even trim a little bit off of what I did the last time so that they're both identical, just like this, okay? But then I did trim that little curve right here with another little move of my tool. I didn't want to point right there, and I certainly could have done that with scissors. So let's go ahead, now I've got two pieces. One is fusible side. Okay, so they're mirror images of each other. I'm going to cut off the bottom just like this so they truly are mirror images of each other. Now I just realized this one, I cut it where there was no fusible. That's okay. I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm going to pretend there's fusible on there. And I can always go back and add a little dab of glue if I really want to use this piece. But remember, this is just my prototype. I'm probably not gonna use these colors on this scallop shell. I wanna find something that looks more like a scallop shell in the fabrics that I choose. So I'll probably try to find a fabric that has a little bit of a ripple to it, 
a little bit of a squiggly line or a stripe. If I had pink stripes going across on a beige fabric, that would be a gorgeous little scallop shell. And it doesn't take a lot of playing to make something that resembles a scallop shell. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be as realistic as a real shell, but you really get the flavor of the scallop shell and of the conch shell when you just play with some of these basic shapes. So yeah, could I play with this a little bit more? Can, could I make more segments? Could I make this even more realistic? Absolutely. But I'm gonna come back on the screen with you right now because I don't feel as though we have to get that particular. I think that we can just do whatever makes us happy without over stressing that it's perfect. You're gonna get the idea. The person who's looking at your quilt is gonna get the flavor of what you are trying to do. Okay, wonderful. Um, 182 has creating the jellyfish. Thank you for that, Penny. Um, I love the way you have big multi-month projects and you have these smaller projects that would also make wonderful gifts. Thank you, Bev. That is one of my goals. Uh, fantastic. Um, congratulations on the huge project of numbering your episodes. Wow. Well, we haven't gone back and numbered all the episodes. We counted them all and then we started with about 180 and went up from there. So we haven't renumbered all the episodes, but we will be working on that as a major project this year. Well, this has been so much fun to create some more under the sea art with you. I hope that you've had fun making our shells today and that you will continue using your inspiration, your uh, photos that you find on um, the internet or drawings that you find to continue inspiring you to make your Under the Sea quilt. I don't know how many more episodes we'll do of Under the Sea. I think we have enough design ideas and enough critters to get started putting this all together. So why don't we commit to one more week to pull all of these design elements together and then eventually I will get this made into a real project. In the meantime, we're gonna be working on individual instructions for the critters with photos of how to make each shape and that way we can put that up on our uh, membership page so our members already have a series of garden critters we're going to make a new series of underwater critters for our members only now of course if you're not a member and you're here on facebook you get to see the whole play process of how we put these designs together but it will be our members that get the finished polished up project as individual patterns with instructions and with exact instructions on how to cut each shape. If you're interested in finding more about the Ahead of the Curve membership, you can go to my website, suepellindesigns.com. You can also go to appliqueschool.com. That's where you can learn all about the Ahead of the Curve membership. Now, membership is always open. You can join at any time. And certain times in the year, we do have a bonus period. Uh, today is, is the last day to join to be included in our new member orientation. All of the bonuses are gone, but our new member orientation doesn't happen until tomorrow. So if you want to join ahead of the curve, come on down and join us and you can be included in that new member orientation tomorrow so you can get off to a great start starting your ahead of the curve membership. Now, I love it when you come visit me here on Sewing in Slippers with Sue. If you're watching the replay, please put a comment so I know that you were here. And if you have any questions, I check those comments all the time. So ask your questions in the comments and I'll be able to help you.
So, so long for now. I hope you've had fun working under the sea with me on Sewing in Slippers with Sue. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.